Aloha, I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And today's journey is very, very special. We are going to visit with my dear friend, and you know I only talk to dear friends, Gary Kuboto on Maui. So with the magic of ThinkTech, here we are across the ocean. Gary is a dear Hi. friend. And hi, Gary, I have known as an activist, as well as a writer and a publisher and an he was in newspapers and he was out rep community and activist pro projects. And then his latest, most is his play, The Legend of Kohola. So, real quick, there you are. Gary, tell us about Gary. Well, I was born and raised in Hawaii, in, on Oahu. And um, I came, I got my education around the same time as the uh, Vietnam War was rising up and became an, an activist of sorts. Um, and then associated with a group called Kakua Hawaii, which was a a group that fought a lot of evictions uh, on Oahu um, and successfully fought these evictions back in the early 1970s. Then I went back to school um, and to earn a living, basically, and learn a learn a professional trade of sorts as a journalist. And I work I've worked for several newspapers in Hawaii and the, on Guam and. Um, now I am retired, but one of the things that I did in the meantime is I wrote a play um, that received the national grant from the National Performance Network of New Orleans, and that enabled me to um, produce the play. And now it's uh, it's touring um, in Hawaii and elsewhere, just depending upon whether we can uh, do the financial arrangement and and everything everything in place, including the actor. Well, it is such a fabulous play. Tell us about it. Um, it kind of thing. I, I'm not sure that I have the right words to describe it, because one man show. However, it's the backdrop and the pictures that that move with the show that gives it the depth and and of course the actor is superb. So tell us the story. Where you, Gary? The, the story revolves around a uh, Hawaiian cowboy on Kauai called Kaluai Koolau. It's a historically based place, so I had to do quite a bit of research, more than a year, and then it took me about six months to write the play. Of course, you could say it took a lifetime to write it because the skills that uh, you, know, you acquire take a lifetime. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to, to um, get into some of his background it, it's about basically love and survival, his love for his family and the survival of his family, despite attempts by the, um, despite the, the, the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy and attempts by the new government to force him and his son to uh, Kalapapa on the island of Molokai, where there was a Hansen's disease colony. He didn't want to go there and refused to go there. So he went into Kalalau Valley in North Kauai and uh, uh, resisted. Resisted the uh, militia? The government forces. Resisted yeah, the government forces the that government had been forces. sent to capture him. And he was very successful in doing it, actually, because of his knowledge of, of the terrain. And he was a good shot. And it was one of these, um, he wasn't looking for trouble, but he just didn't want to go. So. In, in of the eyes of not. <laughs> yeah, it would have been terribly difficult had he gone because there would not have been a family family structure to support him. A lot of the people who lived in Kalalau Valley who were um, had Hansen's disease relied upon their their kin to uh, drop off food once in a while. And, you know, it, it, it had that system of support, whereas taking him and his son to a remote island, a peninsula uh, that they called the living grave um, was not 
something that he wanted to see happen, especially to his son, who was only nine years old at the time. Yeah. So, but that would mean leaving his wife and the other children. Exactly. And leaving them that was another factor yeah. that happened because back then you had a situation where for a while they allowed kukuas or family members to go along with the Hansen disease patients. But then they, the, the new government and the Board of Health uh, changed that policy. And uh, it upset quite a few people because a lot of them who were, who were uh, had getting the Hansen disease were, were native Hawaiians and very attached to, you know, of course, the, the area where they lived and the families. And, and so it, it was a very difficult time for them. Well, this was 18 what? The year. 1893. He went into the valley 1890. in 1892. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then um, in 1893, um, he, there was the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy and then a stepped up effort to get the lepers out of uh, Kalalau Valley. And um, he had warned people that if they try and go into the valley, he would shoot them. And so a deputy sheriff went into the valley and he shot the deputy sheriff and killed them. And then um, all hell broke loose because the new government that had just overthrown the monarchy felt threatened by his actions. So they sent essentially a, a, a contingent from their militia and deputies. I think there was about more than 50 of them uh, and including a cannon to try and capture him. A cannon into the valley? Yeah, a corrupt cannon. It, the, it was the kind that <laughs> you put actually shells in and fire it. Um, fortunate for him and unfortunate for them, uh, they fired it at the wrong time and he had already left the cave that in which they tried to shoot uh, the, the shells into. And so the, he wasn't there. But one of the things that happened was his, they tried after... Um, two of the men had been shot by him, the soldiers themselves, and one had accidentally shot himself. Um, they went oh. and tried to get his sister. First, they tried to get his mother, um, but she was too sick. And then they forced the sister and her husband at gunpoint to go into the valley and try to flush him out. Um, but by the time they did all that, he had left that area of the cave. And so... They, were, they, they weren't able to find him. And so they declared him either dead or um, or something like that in this abandoned efforts, basically, which, you know, they probably should have done from the very start because that way no one would have been killed. Well, it, 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 like I said, it's just a marvel. It's just the actor. What's his name? He is fabulous. What's he's, his name? He's Moronai Kanekoa. And Moronai um, is a was born and raised on Maui, and he's now living in Los Angeles as an actor. He's a native Hawaiian, and uh, he was a University of Hawaii Regent Scholar. They pick about one out of what tw only 20 a year, and it includes tuition, books, and, and living expenses. So he's no ordinary person. And he also has a master's in drama from the U University of Southern California. When I when I was looking for him, I had pretty much cast the net wider because I was unable to find someone who could remember the lines. And <clears throat> I got a call from him, and we interviewed Moore and I by Skype because I, I had sent uh, letters to various drama departments and in, in colleges. And after we decided to pick him out, like I asked him, so you know where do you where do you come from? Where do you live? And they said, oh, my parents come from Kahului. And, you know, I live in on Maui, too. So I said to him, you mean I have to go all the way to California to find somebody who lives about seven miles from me? God. <laughs> so, but sometimes that's what it takes. Huh? It, was, it was very, yes. it was a, of kind course. Of a funny moment. Do we have a me. picture of him? Morton and I have done about 20, uh, 22 performances. And it's, it's ranged from um, him being us being invited to Kalapapa by the State Department of Health and also us touring, say, Los Angeles, Berkeley, and Sacramento. In Sacramento, 
there were more, it was a sold out crowd and there were more than 600 people in attendance at the Sacramento City College Performing, from Performing Arts Theater. And it was very gratifying to see so many people who were grateful for um, his, uh, his portrayal of Kalawai Ko'olau. And that's, uh, that's been our goal basically, to tell the story from, um, uh, with a native Hawaiian performer from, from a point of view of that historical moment and to educate people about uh, an important part of history and that's the, around the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. There's a lot of relevance in that, uh, uh, of course, with all the sovereignty. Did we find a picture? Yeah. Did, did we find a picture at all? They'll they'll keep looking. Just go ahead. And, uh, but <clears throat> when you're in uh, California and other locations, do they really get the depth of the uh, struggle at the time of the overthrow? Do they understand that? I think they, 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 and it's, those who are Hawaiian have read a lot of the stories that, that, um, of Pi'ilani, uh, his wife, and, and also there's, a uh, W.S. Merwin and Folding Cliffs, who wrote an ode about Kualao, and then Jack, jo I mean, um, Jack London, who wrote a story as well. So they're, they're familiar with, uh, various accounts, but in my account is basically from Ko'olau speaking himself about what happened. And that's, that's injecting an entirely different kind of perspective about how someone with his wilderness skills and with his conflicted emotions um, had to deal with uh, the situation. You see, he was, <clears throat> he and his wife were educated until age 17 in a mission school, which meant that they um, knew how knew how to read and write in English, um, and also that you know they had this strong tie to the um, Christian Church, and and how to reconcile that at that moment during the overthrow was a very difficult thing to do, considering the fact that you had um, sons of uh, grandsons of missionaries who were. In, uh, a part of uh, the overthrow. And so we we address these issues in the play. And uh, I know some people feel that it's a, the play is a bit rebellious, but sometimes, um, you know, you need to have the truth portrayed. Um, and to speak the truth is an important part of being, of course, a journalist in my in my field. And so I'm willing, I'm willing to uh, take whatever criticism comes my way as long as it is the truth and it's provable. Well, tell me, do you real do you get criticism or because it's such a beautifully done, I'm maybe I'm just uh, biased, but it's such a be beautifully portrayed just the quality of the of the play, the whole atmosphere, the beautiful way you transpose the pictures behind the screen and behind the stage because it is a one person one man's talking it, it is just so beautiful I, i'm maybe i am being biased but how do you i'm talking about the pushback the, the mm -hmm. comments you were talking about is it just I, that they I, yeah. don't like don't like the story I that, the, the yeah i think I think I, it's hard for me to identify exactly what what sometimes people feel. I think that um, it doesn't quite portray the the native Hawaiian in the way that some people some people attached to the visitor industry might want. Um, here's a Hawaiian uh, who's a man, a live male uh, figure, and he's he's funny, he's loving, he's argumentative. And he has all these qualities, um, but he also has a quality of willing willingness to to speak his mind and rebel. And I think that um, people, some people, aren't accustomed to that or afraid of that. But that's the way things were back then, and that's the way things are right now. You know, with the uh, the sovereignty movement, things like that. You know, we don't have. I don't think there's any kind of advocate. Uh, 
of a violence or anything like that. I think, but speaking one's mind, trying to speak the truth is an important part of coming to terms with history and with with oneself as a human being. Well, it is a different uh, portrayal than what the tourist industry would have us believe. So you're right. If if you're looking for that image that the today's tourism gives us, this is quite a stretch, quite a difference, which is the way it should be. You know, the, the honesty with which he portrays, the honesty with which he, he's just, I, I can't say enough great things about him. Um, I wish that for those people that don't get to see the play, if there was a way to video to, to um, the tape, the, the play, not video, but real, um, what do we call it? Photography, motion picture quality, so that the depth and the whole thing is is just there for, for those of us, for those people that haven't been able to see the play. How many mm -hmm. times have you shown the play and how many places? Um, 22 and um, <clears throat> it's been on to 22, the 22 performances. It's been to mm -hmm. <clears throat> Kauai, Maui, Molokai, um, and um, Oahu. Honolulu. And, yeah. Yeah. Honolulu. Yeah. And it's been to um, Los Angeles, Berkeley, and Sacramento. Um, when we started out, uh, my expectations were a bit small. I I had written the play and uh, I just wanted to see um, it read and to have a reading. And to my surprise, when I sent out the script, the people who wanted to read the play uh, included Ed Ka'ahea, who's a well-known uh, actor uh, with Booga Booga uh, a long time ago, and then yeah. Kale Wolford who actually um, was in the process of uh, developing his film, The Haumea. And Keo had acted as a king in The King and I at the London Palladium. So he, seeing that they were interested, helped me a lot in um, moving forward with the whole pl uh, plan of trying to get it produced. And luckily, um, we did get a grant from the National Performance Network of New Orleans. Uh, I was one of six, one of, one of a, there were six people selected out of more than 60 applicants and I was one of them. And so um, it was a competitive process. And, and so that only made me think, well, you know, there must be something to it. So I kept on going, especially after, when we, when we went to, different libraries and had these readings and there was only a spotlight and we darkened the windows when we lift when we had the lights lifted up and suddenly you could see the people many of them were crying and i've never seen that in a theater before and that told me that we had something very special it's a gift you know i i wrote it but i don't feel that necessarily i'm the one who 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 did it you know because it, it it takes a it village of people people i know who are hawaiian people i know of different ethnicities who have helped me in my way as a writer to to get to that point yeah. well i sat and cried so but then i cried commercials so i'm not <laughs> of course i'm <laughs> being biased but, <laughs> but it it i did cry yes and um so what's next? Where do you go from here? We are we have completed filming the play um, itself oh, and uh, we're editing it. And what we plan to do at the very least is to send it to various theaters um, to see if they might be interested in having the one man show at their theaters. Um, I don't know if it's going to be good enough for a commercial quality to, to be able to sell sell it as a film per se um it's difficult already to to do a one-man play and something like this takes a lot of cutting and a lot of imagination in order to bring out the actual acting 
I think that the, the best example of that has been, however, uh, Terrence Knapp and Father Damien. Um, and that was actually oh, yes. performed at Kennedy Theater many years ago. And I saw it when it premiered. I was there and uh, I was just blown away by how Terrence Knapp created the, the character. And so um, I immediately looked for the writer, of course, because I'm a writer, who was Aldith. Eldite Morris and I, I within the two weeks of that time I spent a lunch with her at her home talking about how she went about writing the play and so um, she was very kind to do that and it I had a path at that point <clears throat> I didn't realize it at the time but it, it did help me you say that you had a what? A path to on how to develop the oh, play. A path. Yeah. Oh, great. And, yeah. And she um, so, she collaborated with um, Terrence Knapp on developing the play herself because this was her first one of one of her first plays. Uh, one of well. The way she said it was basically that at times, like he would make suggestions that she would think about it and she she would agree. And Terrence, Terrence Knapp was just an extraordinary actor. I mean, he had been with the um for the Royal London Theater, and and um he was he actually as Father Damien um in a film, getting back to why these kinds of films are extraordinary. He actually won a Peabody Award for his acting in great performances on on public television nationwide. So it can be done, although it's very challenging. And uh, we've been struggling uh, on our own. Uh, he had the support of Hawaii Public TV and Nino Martin, who was uh, yes. then um, the the head of the he was the artistic director. And Nino. And him took about six months of shooting at Kennedy Theater in order to create the rendition that was eventually shown on great performances. Um, we've had to, I've had to spend my money in order to fly in a cinematographer from Los Angeles who's a friend in order to shoot and just develop this preliminary uh, rendering of the play itself. Yeah. So it's well, been a hard, you, it's been a bit harder, you, but you know, we're yeah. still going for it. Well, would you look at or work with a Hawaii public television for this? Because it's so special. Have you reached out to them at all? Um, yeah, we have, uh, uh, you know, we've invited them to the play, um, but I'm not sure anyone came, frankly. Um, I think that um, a lot of people think when they see the, when they think of plays, they think that it's a community theater production of sorts. Uh, and it's nothing like that. I mean, you know, Marsha, as a journalist, I worked in Mau for the Maui News like that. And a lot of people um, were, were amazed when I won four national awards, including awards from the National Press Club, National Newspaper Association for the writing that I did. And this is basically um, another example of, you know, what I'm trying to do and what I'm striving for in terms of quality. Um, and uh, it's it's sometimes a, a struggle because I think that um, people have it set in their mind exactly what they think already. Um, and it takes a bit of a break away from that in order for them to come to terms with um, a different kind of writing. And and uh, I'm not from within the um, the group of people who uh, are associated with various theaters. I I come from it from a journalist background and from a writer's background, and um, that makes it perhaps sometimes difficult. But I also realize it, if it hadn't been for that background, I wouldn't have been able to write the play the way I have. Now speaking of background. Before we run out of time, 
let's get back to your activism, especially <laughs> at Kiowa <Columbus> Valley. <laughs> real quick. Yeah, that's, yeah that, okay. That, that's real, such real a quick. great well, period of time. Yeah. 19, early 1970s, there's maybe four or five Asians who work for newspapers. If you were to go to the University of Hawaii and look at the concourse, out of 300 people, if you saw five people who were Native Hawaiian or Filipino, um, you know, that was pretty good. Things have changed an awful lot since that time. And, and the whole notion of Kalama Valley has changed since uh, we were successful in resisting evictions and helping to preserve um, these communities intact. Filipino communities like Oda Camp, Waihole, Waikane, Heiakea. We even did a sit-in at the University of Hawaii to preserve ethnic studies back in 1972. And the whole point of that was to be able to, to tell the stories, our history, our way. And that's what I've attempted to do in this whole process of uh, becoming a journalist and becoming uh, a playwright. And well, let me just sure. add a, a footnote here. You mentioned 1974. At that time, at the University of Hawaii, the Hawaiian language was in um, the foreign language department. And there was one class in Hawaiiana. That's it. So. Yeah, I, exactly. And anyway. I'll tell you what's, yeah, now Hawaii, the, you know, the Hawaiian is a, a the first language side by side with English mm -hmm. and there are charter schools uh, that teach Hawaiian and a very dear friend of mine, Larry Kamakaviva Ole, received uh, a resolution honoring him. He was the leader of our group, Kokua Hawaii, honoring him for being a part of the start of the Hawaiian Renaissance. So it's come full circle where we were like vilified or criticized for what we did to the point where people begin to understand that what we did was to push the envelope outward and create a broader conversation so that people could begin to understand their own history and begin to stand up and begin to discuss it. Yeah. Well, we are just about out of time and this has been a great pleasure as always. And I am looking forward to your filming and moving it on so everybody gets to see this. It is most important. It is vital, especially with this new movement of the young Hawaiians. They really need to see this story. So Gary, darling, thank you. Thank, thank you. you thank you so much. It was a pleasure for talking spending with you. This time with me. And send my love to Melinda. I will. <laughs> um, Aloha. <laughs> and Aloha, and we will see you next time.